The 01E is a six-speed manual transmission. It is manufactured by Geetalk Germany. It is installed in Audi B5 and C5 S-Line models. This includes S4, A6, and All-Road. The All-Road version has a built-in oil pump that pumps oil to an external oil cooler. The transmission is made up of three sections. The front section, which contains the front differential. The middle, which contain the gear housing, and the rear, which contain the torsion differential. The top shaft is the input shaft. This shaft gets driven by the engine through the clutch. The bottom shaft is the output shaft. Notice that this shaft is hollow. The shaft that contains the front pinion runs through this shaft and is driven by the torsion differential. Here you can see, when I rotate the solid shaft, it drive only the front axle. It does this through the pinion gear in the picture. Now see what happens when I rotate the hollow shaft. Both the input and output shaft rotates while the solid shaft stands still. This is proof that power it transferred from the engine to the hollow shaft only. The solid shaft is independent and does not get driven directly. So how does this solid shaft get driven? There is a special differential in the rear of the transmission called a torsion differential. It is spline to both of these shafts. It takes a single rotational force and direct it to both axles. Here is a better view of the pinion gear. From this angle, you can see that the shaft it's on runs through the hollow output shaft. In other documentation, the output shaft is sometimes called the lay shaft or counter shaft. This is the front end of the transmission. It contains the front differential that the pinion gear drives. Here you can see the bearing that supports the input shaft and the shift forks. You can also see the race for the pinion bearing and the differential gears. The gears to the right drives the oil pump and the speedometer. The pinion gear is supported by 23 tapered roller bearing. In this picture, gear 5 and 6 is missing, however the location for them is shown. Gears marked with a C are free floating gears, this means they are not fixed to the shaft. Instead, they ride on needle bearing. Gears marked with an F are fixed gears, this means they are either built onto the shaft or splined to it. The sliding collar used for selecting gears are also splined to the shafts and must rotate with it. Pay special attention to the way in which the gears appear. For example, the last gear on the shaft is not 6, it is 5th gear. The same goes for 3rd and 4th and 1 and 2. From front to back, the higher number gear comes first. This is because of the H pattern built into to the selector mechanism. When you move the gear lever forward, the rod actually move backwards, and when you move the lever backwards, the rod move forward. This is due to the fulcrum point in the lever that causes the movement to switch direction when pushed or pulled. The point of fulcrum determines the distance of travel before the gear engages. This is what gets modified when you buy a short throw shifter. 
The reverse gear is an idler gear, it is not shown in the picture. It make contact with the first gear sliding collar and the fixed reverse gear on the input shaft, thus reversing the direction of rotation of the output shaft. One should take note that, although the fixed reverse gear appear to be touching the 1-2 sliding collar in the picture, they do not make contact directly. From this view, you can see the reverse idler gear. Notice that in the normal state, it sit to the left of the shift collar. Only when reverse is selected, it is moved forward between the input shaft and the shift collar. The input shaft is removed to achieve this view. You must depress the clutch to allow the idler gear to synchronize with the input shaft and the shift collar. This is because the input shaft spins with the engine when the clutch is engaged and stop when the clutch is disengaged. Even with the engine off, synchronization may not be possible due to the fact that the input shaft need to be free to move for synchronization. The engine coupled to this transmission rotates clockwise when viewed from the front and counterclockwise when viewed from the back. The engine and the output shaft rotate in opposite direction. Unless reverse gear is selected, then they turn in the same direction. There are three standard brass type shift fork for forward gear selection and one push pull type for reverse. Selection of each gear is achieved by using a shaft with a gated pattern that allow only the intended shift fork to be actuated. The gated pattern ensure only one shift fork will be chosen. This shaft is mounted transversely at the top of the front section and accessible from the right side. Movement of the shift lever cause it to move right or left in the axial direction or rotate forward or backward. The pivot finger at the bottom is what gets aligned with the correct shift rod. When the shaft rotates it push or pull the appropriate shift rod. For example, if you lean the gear lever left then forward to select first gear, the shaft will move right and rotate forward which in turn will move the first second shift fork backwards to select first gear. To understand this, you must understand how the shift rod is organized. The first one is reverse, the second one is first slash second, the third one is third slash fourth, and the last one is fifth slash sixth. When you move the gear stick left, the shaft move right, and when you move the stick right, the shaft move left. From this understanding, one can see why the reverse position is to the left in the H pattern. The shift control shaft is held in by detents. These are ball bearing pushing on a spring. There are two detents supporting the control shaft. The one in the front, marked with an F, rides in the gate so you select the proper shift rod. The one in the back centers the shaft so you can easily select third slash fourth. Detents also creates the spring tension you feel when moving the gear shift lever left and right. They are also used to lock the shift forks in the intended position. They fall into cutouts made on the shift rod bus locking them. Without them, the transmission would jump out of gear. There are three cutouts on the shift rods. The middle cutout lock the rod in a position that keep the shift collar in the middle, as shown here. In this position, no gear is selected. The reason for locking at this position is to prevent the transmission from going into gear without the user's consent. Vibration and thrust can cause accidental gear engagement if the rod was left to slide back and forth. For example, if a forward gear and reverse is selected at the same time, the transmission would be locked. This is because the output shaft would be directed to turn in both direction at once, which is impossible. The other two cutouts lock the transmission into the selected gear. Without this, you would have to hold the gear stick in the gear position. Detent identification. The detent marked SB in the video locks the 1-2 shift rod. ST lock 3-4. 
the top left lock 5 slash 6, and the top right lock reverse. This is the switch for the backup lights. The notch on the shaft actuate the switch when reverse is selected. The gear chain mechanism consists of two gears called a gear set. One gear is fixed to the shaft, while the other is free to rotate. One gear is the driver gear and the other the driven gear. The driver gear is the gear with the power, and the gear it mates with is called the driven gear. In first and second speed, the fixed gear is the driver, and third through sixth speed, the floating gear is the driver. All gears, except reverse, rotate at the same time. This is called constant mesh, meaning all gears are physically touching each other, you cannot rotate one without the others. Because of their dimension, they also rotate at different speeds thus given different gear ratios. The input shaft spin with the engine. Only if the clutch is depressed will it stop. In neutral, this rotation is not transferred to the output shaft, because a gear from each of the gear set is floating on bearing. If any of the floating gears become fixed, power will be transmitted through this gear to the output shaft. This means that both gears in the set will be fixed. A floating gear can become fixed by using a hub and a sliding collar. The hub is splined to the shaft and rotate with it. The sliding collar will lock the floating gear to the hub. Because the hub is splined to the shaft, power is transferred through it. To understand how the floating gear gets locked to the shaft, look at this video. The wheel on top is the hub. It is fixed to the shaft. Notice the splines in the center that allow it to be fixed to the shaft. Also notice the larger grooves, or splines, on the outer circumference of it. This is what allow the collar to slide from gear to gear. Now look at the gear. You will notice that it has teeth on the inner side of it. The sliding collar will slide over both the hub and the gear teeth thus locking them together. This is what the locking collar looks like. Notice that it has similar splines on the inner side of it. The shift fork will slide the collar over both the hub and the gear, thus locking the gear to the shaft. The groove on the outer circumference is what the shift fork rides in. This one select first and second speed. It is the only sliding collar with teeth on the outside. The teeth is used to drive the reverse idler gear. All the other ones will be smooth on the outside. The shift collar is also called the sliding sleeve. The forward speed shift forks are made out of brass to reduce wear. They are mounted in the grooves of the sliding collars. On gear selection, they push the collar in either direction. If you still don't understand the gear selection process, just remember that the hub is fixed to the shaft, and the gear is free to rotate. Sliding the collar over the gear teeth and hub make the gear becomes fixed. Now that you understand how the gear selection is made, we can now take a look at synchronization. Because all the gears are spinning at different speeds, and the speed of the shafts changes, sliding the sleeve from the hub to the gear teeth can only be done when the speed of both matched. 
for example, look at the inner teeth of the first and second gear. Even though they are the same size and diameter, they rotate at different speeds. This is because the outer diameter of the gear sets are different. If you start the car in first speed, first gear will be spinning slow, but produces a lot of torque. At the same time, the second gear is spinning but faster. If you try to slide the collar from first to second without slowing down the speed of the second gear, the collar and gear teeth will not align. The same thing goes if you are in second speed and want to move to first. You must speed up the first gear for the collar and gear to align. To speed up or slow down the speed of a gear, a synchronizer ring is used. If is often made out of brass or some other material such as carbon. It is spined to the gear and placed between the gear and the hub. The inner surface of the collar is tapered and cut to the same angle as the synchronizer ring. When gear selection is made, the collar interfere with the ring and create enough friction to speed up or slow down the gear. Also note that if the speeds are not matched, the ring prevents the gear teeth and collar from making contact. In other words, it block gear selection. When synchronization occurs, friction is relieved and the ring twists slightly to align its notches that allow teeth contact. The synchronizer ring sits on springs. These same springs are used to keep the sliding collar in the middle position. Notice that when I let go the collar, it springs back to neutral position. The detents is what hold the selected gear in place. The synchronizer has to overcome the momentum of the input shaft, which the engine is turning. To extend the life of the rings and sliding collar, always press the clutch when changing gears. This free up the input shaft so the synchronizers can work more effectively. The reverse gear uses a different type of synchronizer. To engage reverse, you stop the output shaft from turning by coming to a full stop. When the attempt is made to put the car in reverse, the synchronizer help to slow down the speed of the input shaft so it can also become still. When both shafts are still, the idler gear can easily slide between them. Depressing the clutch disconnect the input shaft from the engine, which allow the synchronizer to effectively apply its braking effect. The idler gear slider rod is fastened to the gearbox case with a pivot bolt. It is free to move side to side. The reverse actuator rod is hooked to this rod and is pushed to actuate reverse. Understanding gear ratio. This transmission is code FTJ. The ratios listed are gear teeth ratios. It is the amount of teeth on the driven gear to the driver gear. For example, in the first gear set, the driven gear has 30 teeth and the driver gear has 8. The ratio can also be listed as decimal. The formulas driven gear teeth count divided by the driver gear teeth count. 30 divided by 8 equals 3.750 or 3.750 to 1. This means that the driver gear will make 3.750 revolution when the driven gear makes 1. In first speed, the gear with 8 teeth is the driver gear. Driver gear is also called drive gear or input gear. Driven gear is also called output gear. To rephrase what was said earlier, the input makes 3.750 revolution when the output makes 1. 
The last gear ratio in the drivetrain is called the final drive. This will be the axle differential. As listed, it has 35 teeth on the driven slash output gear and 8 teeth on the drive slash input gear. The ratio in decimal is 4.375 to 1. This means that the driver slash input gear makes 4.375 revolution when the driven slash output gear makes 1. To calculate the total ratio, multiply the current transmission ratio by the final drive ratio. For example, 3.750 multiply by 4.375 equals 16.406 to 1. This means the transmission input shaft turns 16.406 revolution when the wheels make 1.